hello everybody welcome to another live stream for history valley podcast today i'm joined by almost dr jack bull <laughs> how are you doing today jack yeah very well i have a cough so please forgive me viewers if i'm choking and spluttering hey not alone i'm uh, a little sick today myself <laughs> but we'll uh we'll be all right okay so we're talking about the formation of the new testament canon and, and as far as i understand it you have a PowerPoint slide you like the show? Yes. I'll see. There we go. Okay. So you and I, Jacob, and many of your viewers have spent almost uh, our entire lives as adults researching these texts. <clears throat> we obsess over them. We are constantly reading both the primary literature and the secondary literature. Right. And all of this is with an attempt, I think, to work out what they say. But so often we neglect the question of where they came from. We forget why these, particularly the 27 books of the New Testament, have become a place where we've sunk so much time. Where we could have gone outside and played in the fields and frolicked. Instead, we sat inside in small rooms, reading dusty old books, trying to learn something about the content of these 27 texts. But today, I wanted to enlighten some of your viewers, um, and perhaps you as well, with the history of these texts. Not so much as we usually do, looking at the, uh, the, how the texts were composed, um, and perhaps who wrote them, but rather once they were completed, how they got from being solitary texts rumbling around the Middle East to a Bible, a book that has shaped all of the Western civilization for the last 1700 years or so. In the picture, we have a text we're going to come on to later, Codex Sinaiaticus, which is one of the most famous uh, um, codexes we have of the New Testament. But even that famous codex is not quite as it seems. But like I say, we'll come on to it. When addressing the canon, and I gave this lecture to a few undergrads a couple of months ago, we have to decide what question we're actually seeking to answer. Because there are several preliminary questions even before we get to the 27 texts of our New Testament that you and I have in our Bibles. The first is, what do we even mean by canon? This word is strange to us, and we only know it really in one, uh, in one context, that being the Bible. But what does the term actually mean? We need to decide what that is, uh, not to sound too much like Jordan Peterson or another philosopher, but we have to define our terms before we start. Secondly, and again, this may come as a surprise to a few who are new to the space, we must ask which canon, or perhaps more precisely, whose canon we're referring to. Those 27 books that you and I have are not what everyone else has, or at least what some others have. And perhaps we should look at someone else's canon rather than being so narrow minded as to only look at Western Christianity's version of the Bible. And then we need to decide whether we're looking at the old or the New Testament, both went through a very different process of gathering information, writing it down, copying it, disseminating it, etc. And then both went through different criteria to be judged as canon. Some of those criteria that need to be looked at then or that were looked at when signing upon the canon, includes things that we have covered more about on this channel. Things like authorship, who wrote the text, and closely linked to that, when was the text written? And then lastly, when all of these things are said and done, what is the process of canonization? How does someone decide, with all those things considered, what goes in the final book? First, we answer with the simplest question. What does it mean? What does canon mean? It comes from the Greek word canon. And that basically just means a standard, a rod, a rule, or a measure. In this context, it's the text by which 
we measure our own theologies, doctrines, and practices. Now, to some extent, one might argue that in the process of canonization, we put the cart before the horse, i.e. the church decided on its doctrines and practices and then chose books that coincided with that. On the flip side, one might argue uh, that the, the horse was in the right order to the cart and that it, the text was decided and then we discern some truth. Maybe we'll have a conversation about that a bit later with viewers if they wish to raise it. But now we know what a canon is. Okay, it's going to be, it's not necessarily these, these, these books that we have in our Bible. It's a rule, the measure with which things can be judged. So what are the stages then of canonicity? How is something judged? How do texts get, like I said, from those individual pieces of paper rattling around all the way into the most published and bought book of all time? We've spoken a lot on this channel about the early formation of these texts pondered their origins. And any writer, whether it be a fiction or non-fiction, if you think that's uh, what the Bible is, um, has to gather material. Everyone needs inspiration. Even J.K. Rowling needs to think a little bit about the setting, the characters, the protagonists and antagonists that are going to perform on the screen. In the case of the Bible stories in the Gospels or with Paul, you might be looking at, um, and we'll do a case study of this in a second, whether they get the material from other apostles or whether they get it from visions or through prayer or whether they're responding to pastoral needs of a particular church. But once the author has done the thinking, as it were, they then need to systematise their material. Anyone who's written any text will tell you that the first thing they write is not the last thing that they publish. I'm currently going through the laborious process of editing my dissertation for my PhD. And let me tell you, it's arduous. The amount of mistakes I made, the stuff that I wrote earlier on in my dissertation is now something I think might be wrong. So I have to go back and edit and chop and change. So we gather our material, then we systematise it into something a bit more coherent. And I put next, inverted commas, publish. We forget this about the ancient world. But to publish or even to write a text takes skill and time and a level of education that many in the ancient world would not have had. In addition to that, once something has been written, to publish it is nothing like you and I would understand today. Hopefully when my thesis is finished, I'll sell 100 million copies and be a millionaire. More likely, probably 100. But we can send it straight off to the printing press and they will just print it. For these guys, once a text has been written, it takes even longer to sometimes for it to be copied and transcribed again at great cost because the materials cost money, the scribe would cost money and the time would be extensive. So when we say publish we mean it goes to its initial recipient. In the case of Paul, let's say he writes to the church in Corinth, that that's the publishing. It goes to the intended recipient. Then those intended recipients might begin to copy texts either at the request of other churches. If I'm at Philippi, I might want a text from Corinth, so I ask them to copy it for me. And it begins the dissemination process. It now begins to enter into circulation, and every church might end up with one. At which point, and again, something we've covered on this channel, people should go back and watch the videos on it. Texts are then attested, in theory anyway. Other authors who respect Paul, for example, will quote him, and this does two things. It both gives credibility to the Pauline text, as the author that's attesting it says it's Pauline, and it also gives authority and credit to the text quoting it, because it shows that they're being backed by Paul. At which point then, in the future, people read both the original text and it quoted in secondary sources, and it's considered authoritative, both because earlier sources considered it authoritative, 
but also because of its author and dating from Paul or Mark, etc. At which point it's then canonized either by an individual or a group, and we'll go through that process more carefully in a minute. And then it reach, reaches a stage of publishing that we might recognize today. We've covered, as I said, on the channel, at least the gathering, systematizing, publishing, copying and dissemination and the attestation of these texts. But now let's have a little look at the last three. I want to give viewers a open and shut case, or at least a supposed open and shut case that scholars have considered um, fairly run of the mill for the past hundred or so years, naturally though with a few dissenting voices. And that's the case of the Gospel of Mark. So traditionally the story is on something like this. Mark was a companion of Peter. He didn't know Jesus personally, but he knows Peter who knew Jesus personally. Peter gives Mark the material he needs by recounting all of the stories and, you know, and, and, and telling him all that he remembers about what Jesus said. Mark then writes it down between 50 and 74 AD, according to most scholars, 50 AD maybe a little bit conservative, uh, 74 AD for the more um, liberal scholars. For those of you who know me, I think it was probably even later than that, maybe second century, but nonetheless. And then after it's written down, church fathers begin to attest it. In particular here, we look to our friend Eusebius, who quotes Papius. And Papius says thus, according to Eusebius about Mark, and the presbyter said this, Mark, having become the interpreter of Peter, wrote down accurately whatsoever he remembered. It was not, however, in the exact order that he related the sayings or deeds of Christ, for he neither heard the Lord nor accompanied him. But afterwards, as I said, he accompanied Peter, who accommodated his instructions to the necessities of his hearers. But with no intention of giving a regular narrative of the Lord's sayings. Wherefore, Mark made no mistake in thus writing some things as he remembered them. For of one thing he took a special care, not to omit anything he'd heard, and not to put anything fictitious into the statements. Note three things here about what Papius, assuming we see, believe Eusebius, I, I forgive the spelling mistake on Eusebius, should be an E, not an I. But it, no, assuming we trust Eusebius' account of Papius here, we can note three things. One, Papius's desperation to legitimise Mark's narrative. He repeats twice that Mark gave due diligence to recounting things accurately, and he added nothing and he removed nothing, according to Papius. But he recognises, and this is a fascinating saying that scholars I think should pour over much more, is that Mark gave no intention of giving a regular narrative of the Lord's sayings. What that means at this point, we could maybe discuss it if, if viewers would like to, but is quite complex. And perhaps I don't think accurately describes what we have in our canons. But nonetheless, we move on. So what happens next then? Well, we get the attested bit. So we had Papius just then attesting Mark as authoritative and as trustworthy. So too does Irenaeus and Origen, the great um, theologian from Alexandria, and Eusebius spelt correctly this time, and other references from the Church Fathers to the Gospel of Mark. Therefore, at meetings of Christians, like at the Synod of Carthage in 397, they say that due to its age, authorship, which they trust, and its content being orthodox, that the Gospel of Mark is authoritative. And everyone agreed forever then that Mark was written around 70 AD and that it was authoritative. And the same happened for the other 26 books as well, and underwent a similar process of gathering, systematization, publishing, attestation, consideration. Here are some rough dates for all of those books. And there we are, thank you very much. That's the opening, that's the formation of the canon. Well, except I suppose for the Old Testament. And I suppose also in the Old Testament, we often glare over the fact that, gloss over the fact that 
the Hebrew Bible, the Roman Catholics, the Protestants, the Greeks and the Slavonics cannot agree on what should go in their Old Testament. But do you know what? It's just the Old Testament. That's it. Thank you very much for coming. Although, again, for those of you who have watched some of my videos already on the channel, you'll know that there are perhaps some issues with this theory. And I don't want to readdress the authorship and dating ones this time. I want to address the New Testament canon list. And why is it that we have these 27 New Testament books? I could also spend the next three hours explaining about why we differ on Old Testament books, but we don't have time for that right now. As I said in my last video, your starter for 10 and uh, answers on a postcard. Who is the first person to use the term New Testament? If you've seen my videos before, you get no credit here. But it's Marcion of Sinope. And here I would hope to say that he would have the same list as the one we did, or do, I should say. It would make our lives a lot easier. And yet, he doesn't. In fact, he doesn't just have a different canon list. He has a radically different list. We lose four Gospels, Acts, the Catholic Epistles, Jude and Revelation, or the Apocalypse of John. We have the antithesis. The antithesis which is a series of uh, comments from Marcion pitting essentially the Old Testament God versus his God of the New Testament. We have the Evangelion, a singular gospel, which is somewhat akin to Luke, but with quite substantial changes. And then St. Pauline epistles, with the noticeable difference being Laodiceans interchange for Ephesians, although they are ostensibly the same epistle, but just readjust to the Church of Laodicea rather than in Galatia. OK, look, everyone knows Marcion was a heretic. He's one dissenting voice. We don't need to worry about his canon list. Let's just pop to the next one. And I'm sure at this point we'll get another canon list that's like ours. Oh. So here we have the canon list of the Moratorian Fragment. Date between the late 2nd century and 4th century AD. For the sake of our discussion, as I always am, I will try and be generous and say it's late 2nd century. Here, we have something more akin to our New Testament, although again, it's not quite mustard. Matthew and Mark have a question mark next to them, and that's because in the fragment we have, they are, that part of the fragment is missing. So it's assumed by scholars that those gospels were included, but we can't say for certain. Then we get to 1, 2, and 3 John. Now, I put a question mark next to one John, and that's because the fragment mentions three epistles of John, and we sorry, two epistles of John as canon. And we assume that one John is probably included in this, but of two and three John, we're not quite sure which way's up. Could be either, could be an amalgamation of the two. But where the question gets really interesting is the additions rather than the omissions, excuse me. It adds the Apocalypse of Peter and the Wisdom of Solomon to its canon list, which is not present in our Bibles today. Both fascinating books, I'd highly recommend you go and read them. So we're getting there. Okay, late second century. It's not ideal for those trying to defend the New Testament of the Bible, but we're getting there at least, we're on the right track. Let's look to another friend, see if they can help us out. Origen. As I mentioned, the great theologian from Alexandria. Eventually discredited by the church as a heretic for some of his more wacky beliefs, but nonetheless a significant figure in all of Christian history. And again, we do OK here. Hey, we've got four Gospels. We've got Acts. We've got most of the Pauline, we've got all the Pauline epistles. He views James, however, 
and two Peter, and two or three John, with some suspicion. But again, I'm more interested here in the additions rather than the possible omissions. He talks of the Gospel of Peter, the Didache, the Proto-Evangelium of James, the Acts of Paul, the Gospel of the Hebrews, the Epistle of Barnabas, the Shepherd of Hamas, and one Clement, as all divinely inspired and authoritative. Isn't that fascinating? Two, four, six, eight additional books that he regards as authoritative. So, we're not quite there again. We've still got too many additions, too many hangers on. We move to our next friend. Bear in mind, Origin, we're already into the third century uh, into the third century. Now we move into the fourth with Eusebius. And he, most interestingly of all, does not just separate between authoritative and non-authoritative. He recognises four separate groupings, which he calls the recognised, the disputed, the spurious, and the heretical. In the recognised, he puts things that are quite important for those who want to justify the New Testament canon. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, all of Paul, 1 John, 1 Peter, and Revelation. In the disputed category, those that are a bit mixed, he puts Hebrews, James, 2 Peter, 2 and 3 John and Jude. And you'll notice that some of these ones are ones that Origen considered slightly mixed. James, Peter, 2 and 3 John. He then has the spurious category, and this is probably, to me, the most interesting category, because he names the Acts of Paul, Hermas, Apocalypse of Peter, Barnabas, the Didache, and the Gospel of the Hebrews as spurious. Presumably, he knows they're not written by who they say they are. But in this category, he includes Revelation. He recognises that John might not actually be Johannine, but yet it still is in the recognised group of authoritative literature. So one of those, those criteria for discerning what goes into which grouping, I like canon or not canon, which was authorship and dating, for Eusebius, might not be that important. John might not have been by John, but that doesn't seem to phase him. Then, in the last category, we get some Gospels which he deems as heretical. Peter, Thomas, Matthias. And some books of Acts of Andrew, John and others, which he doesn't name, as also heretical. You'll notice most interestingly here in the heretical group is the Gospel of Thomas which Eusebius' uh, uh, old master, although not directly, Origen regarded as authoritative. But by the time of Eusebius, a few decades later, they've decided the Gospel of Peter's gone. That one's done. OK, but we've still not got to our canon. There's still things included here or or, or, or um, that aren't included that we would expect to see in our 27 texts into the 4th century. So now our quest continues. We'll try and find another one. Codex Sinaiaticus. Now, we mentioned it at the beginning of the podcast. For those of you who read the Nestle Alonde, the wonderful uh, critical edition of the New Testament, you will notice along the bottom is an apparatus. And even if you don't speak Greek, I highly recommend you get a Nestle Alonde with an apparatus. What that means is that at the bottom, there is a list of all the variations in the manuscripts for each verse in the Bible. And one of those uh, influential texts that they, they reference quite a lot is Codex Sinaiaticus. And when I first went through biblical training, I was under the impression that Codex Sinaiaticus was the creme de la creme of justification for our current Bible. And as you can see in this list here, I wasn't wrong. 
all the Gospels, a good bit of Paul, nice Catholic epistles, Jude and John. But what I didn't know, up until about maybe two years ago, seven years into my biblical study, was that attached on the end, overlooked by so many, is the epistle of Barnabas and the shepherd of Hamas, ruining our pattern yet again, sneaking in at the very end to not give us our books that we need. Post 325 AD, we have not yet agreed upon a New Testament, or at least not the New Testament that we have. At a glance, a few more friends. Clonex, Clara Montanus, adds Acts of Paul, Apocalypse of Peter, Shepherd of Amas, and omits Philippians and 1 and 2 Thessalonians. Look, Hebrews we get overlooked quite a lot a lot of a lot of early scholars and fathers overlook hebrews but to admit philippians and one and two thessalonians brave seal of jerusalem adds the gospel of thomas but finally in 367 a.d athanasius finally gives us what we might recognize as our current new testament and he calls it canonized these are the books he says have been recognised. And yet, a few years later, in the Apostolic Canons, he disagrees again. And they add one or two Clement on the Apostolic Constitutions back into the, into the mix. You'll then get to the Synod and Council of Carthage. These are often the places where Christians will tell you, and in fact, I was looking through the comments of one of the videos I did with you, Jacob, and someone commented that I was wrong about the dating of the canon because the Council of Carthage decided it in 419. But this is not technically the case because the Council of Carthage was not an ecumenical council like Trent, which I've listed below, or before that Chalcedon and Ephesus, etc. In fact, this was a local council. And although Augustine of Hippo, who was at that council, considered it to be all an end all, it, with regard to the discussion of the canon, it wasn't until 1546, think about that now, 500 years ago, that the canon was affirmed as an absolute article of faith. And that used the same list as the Council of Florence in 1442, which in turn came from Carthage. But only in 1546 did the canon become an absolute article of faith in response to the Protestant Reformation in the Catholic Church. That is a flipping long time. Even if you believe Mark or, or Matthew or Paul is second century, that is a long time to wait. Okay, Augustine considered the canon closed way back in Carthage. Even if you accept this position, that Augustine was right and that it was the be all and end all, the Eastern churches didn't agree. And they still differ to this day about what's canonical. But us, in the Latin narrow minded West, forget about this. We're so interested in our scholarship and our canon that we forget that others still do not share this with us. I just wanted to bring then a further thing to this before we move on. And I thought this was an interesting fact. Um, it's the quote given by the Council of Trent when they announced it is an absolute faith. The council declared, if however, anyone does not receive these books in their entirety with all their parts as they are accustomed to be read in the Catholic church and are contained excuse me, to be read uh, contained in the ancient Latin Vulgate edition as sacred and canonical and knowing and deliberately rejects them, the foresaid traditions, let him be anathema. One thing I thought was interesting here was that that doesn't necessarily mean that the canon is closed. Rather, 
it indicates that you must accept all the books that are currently in. Now, presumably, I don't think the Catholic Church is going to propose tomorrow that we add in one Clement to the list, although I might like to see it, or perhaps even the Ignatian letters in the short recension. Give myself a little plug. But nonetheless, um, I thought this an interesting side note. The second interesting side note to this was that this vote for this article only passed by nine votes. So if nine people had changed their mind a slightly different way, this question of the canon might still be open. But we move on. So we've looked now at the stages of canonicity, and we've seen that the considerations here for the authenticity and what they consider canonized is completely different. No one agrees up until at least Carthage, if you're being conservative, about what goes in this, this book. And more importantly, to some extent, I'm not entirely sure that it matters. Now, what I mean by that is that I'm not saying that the early church fathers were frivolous and that and that someone like Origen would have happily accepted the works of Ptolemy. But what I am saying is that he seems, and Cyril of Jerusalem and, and Athanasius, seems to be able to disagree with each other, at least for a time, about what goes in, without calling each other heretic. See, if I now changed my Bible today and ripped out, for example, James, the Catholic Church would regard me as anathema. But I don't think that seems to be the case for our early church fathers. There's a genuine discussion about what might and might not be considered authoritative. So we have then some glaring issues. The first is that the, the, found, the formation of the canon is not cut and dry. The books that you and I obsess over, we are complacent about their origin. We are complacent that these are the ones we should fight over and debate. I'd argue that I would not have a thesis to write if the Ignatian epistles were included as canon and the Pauline ones weren't. I'd probably be writing a really niche dissertation on Paul rather than Ignatius. It's but for the fact that these ones were considered authoritative that we're obsessed by them. And that's a problem. It's not a problem for those who are Christians. Of course, they're the ones that, as a Christian myself, that we consider authoritative and therefore it has their own separate place of study. But for us, as church historians and academics, the fact that academia has managed to convince us to split the study of New Testament texts as separate from the Apostolic Fathers is a tragedy. Where do we cut this line? It, it's arbitrary in the hands of those who decided the canon. It's not based on dating, because as we know, some of the texts in the canon are probably later than some of the texts in the Apostolic Fathers. It's not on authorship, because even some of scholars today believe large parts of Paul aren't Paul, or large parts of John were written by John, etc. We currently have 10,000 scholars working on 27 New Testament books. Think, just, just if you do at home, get a Bible in your hand and just pinch together the New Testament for me. Look at how many people are studying that slither. Now turn to the portion that are scholars that are, uh, are working on the patristics up to, the, up to, say, the 5th or 6th century. It's around a tenth of that. Maybe only around a thousand scholars. Perhaps a little bit more. This has got to be the wrong way around. Even if I give you only the material that was written in the second century, I give you maybe five, six times the New Testament. We have to stop as academics by creating this imaginary line. If we want to understand early Christianity in its totality, we can't keep drawing the distinction. I don't know why that one came up in the middle, but indeed, stop our anachronistic understanding of canon. Stop assuming that the, the Irenaeus and, and, and onward just have a canon. 
that they just understand canon. Because clearly, universally, they don't. So what's the solution to this? How can we how can we begin to solve this problem? Well, largely, the battle is going to take place in your head and my head. It happens first in our minds. That rather than obsessing over these texts as if they're somehow set apart, again, excluding the religious value attached to them, stop making clear lines. Stop clear line <laughs> in your head. Secondly, realise that a canon was a less significant concept for them than us. We are naturally obsessed with it. They are not obsessed like we are. Of course, Irenaeus is, is strong in his rebuttal of Marcion. Of course, as is Tertullian. Of course, as is Origen. But in terms of their own canons, they can hardly be critical. They're throwing stones in glass houses. They don't agree. Lastly, look, there are 10,000 scholars, as I said, looking at these books, but they are producing largely the same material every single year. I have just recently read an un, what will remain an unnamed commentary on the Gospel of John by a very respected scholar that came out recently. And every word of it has been said before, and yet it will be acclaimed as a bestseller and a, and, a, and a groundbreaking production. But not one word of it is new to us. We need innovative scholars with new methodologies who are willing to see the broader picture of early Christian literature. And I don't say that from a place of pride or arrogance. I say it from a place of this is what the community needs. This is what we need to progress as a community. That is basically where we need to get to. And if we don't, we are destined to repeat the same scholarship, not the same mistakes per se, but at least the same scholarship. And who wants to read the same book, especially as an undergrad? Let me tell you, as an undergrad, it's a nightmare because you said you got to read all these scholars. And you realize they're all saying the same thing. But if you don't quote all of them in the right page number, you get into trouble for being lazy. But their content is identical. And it's very frustrating. And I don't think we've progressed that much in the last 50 years. And that's a sad thing to say. But that comes from this, this blockage in our heads that these 27 books are the ones to be obsessed about and everything else is lesser. St. Paul, thank you for your super chat. What is your opinion on uh, Matthew possibly being uh, taken from Marcion or go making Matthew middle to late second century? Do you think it may be later? Well, I think Matthew is second century. Um, I think it is post Marcion. Um, I think that undoubtedly is the case, and, I, and Jacob and I were talking about this off, off air the other day, is that Luke has Marcion as a template. This, this is, I don't think, a question in my mind, although I'm always open to new scholarship, but that seems to be where, where scholarship is leading. And I think that Matthew uses Luke, um, or at least knows Luke slash Marcion, um, from which there they're created. So I think the order is probably Luke, then Matthew, but I, I, I wouldn't want to be pinned either way necessarily. Um, but yes, I think you're absolutely right that Matthew is second century. It definitely uses Marcion either directly or indirectly. Um, and scholars are pretty close to that idea right now. Pardon me, but hopefully with time, they might begin to open up. John Macker, thank you for your super chat. What do you think of Mark being the last of the synoptics? Theory posits Mark removed everything in which Matthew and Luke disagreed. I think it has some merit. And for those that don't know, that's a reference to the Grisbach or two gospel hypothesis. Um, I don't think that Mark is the last synoptic. Um, I, I think there's some question at the minute about to what extent Marcion influences Mark. And so the synoptic scholars, of which I am not one, need to go back 
and look now they have now if they consider Marcion as 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 earlier than all of them, see where all that material lines up, because it may well be the case that the, that the narrative went something like this: Marcion, and then Luke copies it, and then Mark happens independently of of Luke, but simultaneously. So I they don't rely on each other, but they both are composed at the same time using Marcion, and then uh, Matthew happens. One of the interesting things about Marcion is its lack of birth narrative and its resurrection narrative uh, is not like the others really either. And what bits do Mark have that are different to the most of the synoptics? Well, again, that would be the birth narrative. And if you go up to Mark 16, 8, well, the women were afraid and that's the end. And so, again, it seems to have a core bulk of, of, of that same Marcion like material. So, again, it could be that Mark becomes a Catholicized version of just. Um, of Marcion, and then Luke becomes the embellished narrative of Marcion. But scholars are, are a long way off from, um, from, from, I think, understanding that yet. Uh, and, and, and more work needs to be done, again, to see where those similarities align, not just with our synoptic friends, but also with our Marcionite friend. All right, let's get to the next super chat. Um, ben Han, thank you for your super chat. You said everyone knows Marcion was a heretic. Can you please explain why it's so clear? Thanks. Love the channel. Yeah. Well, actually, Ben, Joe, you know what? Um, maybe I can add a little caveat to that. So it's my belief that um, in the earliest parts of Marcion's existence, uh, when he first kicks off, um, I actually don't think that Justin and Irenaeus, perhaps more so Irenaeus, regard him entirely as a heretic. So we know they disagreed with him. Undoubtedly, they didn't like what he had to say, and they wanted to produce their own content, which I believe to be the Gospels and the canonical Pauline letters, in response to him. But one thing I notice in Irenaeus, which I don't in people like the heresiologists Hegesippus or even Origen or Tertullian, is the hatred or, or, or the, the dismissal of Marcion purely as heretic. I think this is a later development that really really starts with Tertullian. Tertullian is, is, is absolutely clear. Marcion, he corrupted Luke, he corrupted Paul, he, he was a horrible little man and he did horrific things for the faith. I, I think in the early church maybe Irenaeus doesn't have that opinion. I think he, he's trying really hard to struggle through Marcion's work. He doesn't like it, he doesn't agree with it. But he does try his best, and I think we have to give Irenaeus the, the, the credit there, um, even though he comes out on the decision that he's wrong. So when I say everyone knows Marcion was a heretic, I'm talking about more into the beginning of the third century than I am the second, um, at, at which point he's then castigated uh, as a corrupter, um, by monster, as a monster, which is a, I think is also an unfair representation of him as well. Ultimately, the victors always write history. The victor was the Catholic Church. They didn't like him. They paid him in a bad light. Also, hence why a lot of his work is lost. You can always really judge how how, how a scholar is viewed uh, or how, how a father is viewed by whether their work is reproduced and and attested today. And unfortunately, Marcion is largely lost. James Valiant, thank you for your super chat. Jack is brilliant, articulate, and utterly charming, and he covers basic material that is often just ignored or glossed over. In short, the ideal guest. And and I think that's sad, James. Right, isn't it? That that it's the really basic stuff that scholars so often choose that they know, but only um only in their unconscious. They sort of accept it as a given, but they very rarely want to expound upon it. You know, every, let's be honest, every New Testament scholar knows about the Marcionite canonists and all of the other canonists that I've just explained. But yet when you read any book about the New Testament or or, or early Christian texts, this is always glossed over. It's I'm not saying it's a conspiracy theory. I'm not I'm not like that. But it is sort of the unsaid rule that we just don't talk about this as, as scholarship. In fact, I, I think in particular to to any Pauline text, any Pauline literature that's ever been written, apart from a few fringe scholars, never mentions that Martin had a completely different set of them. I look to my friend Ignatius as well. Joe, I was reading, I've read all, I reckon that I've read all of the secondary literature on Ignatius now that isn't in Italian. There's a couple in Italian that I, I, I haven't read. But not one of them, since Lightfoot and Curaton, basically, 
and Marcus Vincent have mentioned that other manuscripts exist. Cobb, Batavici, maybe another couple, but nobody wants to talk about it. There have been commentaries written on Ignatius and no one talks about the manuscript tradition in depth. No one gives it proper recognition. And I think that's even more of a tragedy and a criminal offence when it comes to the canon. Because people are so obsessed about these books, and because there's 10,000 people working on them all the time, they should have all the time in the world to tell us everything. And they don't. They cover the same material again and again and again. Authority in the Son of Man in Mark, Eucharistic discourse in John, uh, uh, but uh, genealogies in Matthew. It's the same thing. No new scholarship. All right, let me just get to the next one. All right, there it is. Lee, thank you for your super chat. Bull is a breath of fresh air. Please keep going. Good to have a Christian scholar showing these points. Need much more of this. Well, thank you. I really appreciate that. Yes, I can't comment. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think I've said this before, but I mean, I thought that um, being in a, in a secular college and um, with my largely secular colleagues generally in academia i would find a lot more traction and um acceptance of my views but i was radically uh disappointed by the fact that people don't just not engage with them they actively dismiss them pardon me and that's very difficult and i think that uh you know christians in scholarship have uh you know a really important place um, particularly as you know for me as well they're not just uh, uh in, in texts of intrigue they're, they're texts that rule and define my life they are the measuring stick as it were to a large extent um but for those and so I, and so then, then me being critical of them often can bring me into conflict with others in my faith and also myself sometimes uh you know, Professor Marcus Vincent has not only tutored me from a scholarly point of view but also on a personal point of view as I've wrestled with some of my own my own understandings but one of the things that surprised me is that academics in the secular setting are also massively attached to these these preconceived notions and it's like brother you have nothing to lose here right if it all turned out that it was written 300 years ago by so some crackpot in the desert your life doesn't change okay your book title might but i'd have to reshape my entire being but yet i'm the one saying that you know these more radical positions and you're you're not even recognizing that i might have something to say or that other schools might have something to say and so that that is a strange thing for me i think to be um sort of hated by both sides and somewhere stuck in the middle but thank you lee anyway that's a really nice comment and uh, i appreciate it renzo rodriguez thank you, for, thank you for your super chat what do you think of uh jason badoon's the first new testament excellent if you haven't read it read it if you have read it, read it again. Um, there is a couple of reconstructions of Marcion. Uh, Matthias Klinghart and Jason Badoon are two of them. And Marcus Vincent is producing another one as we speak. Um, the First New Testament by Badoon is, is a good reconstruction, uh, and, I, and I highly recommend it. And to, to get yourself to grips with the Marcionite texts and see how they differ, I also think his introduction is very good, very, very astute, and um, I can't recommend it highly enough. A Muslim apologist, thank you for your super chat. Why were the Shepherd of Hermas and the Epistle of Barnabas excluded from the current canon of the New Testament? For some of those reasons we talked about, um, dating and authorship. Um, Barnabas was considered spurious, as was the Shepherd of Hermas, and its origins were, were doubted and unknown. Um, although a lot of the times when you get these canonists and commentators, they give you more categories than I just give them credit for. Perhaps something like um, Eusebius does, but slightly different. They give you a, a recommended reading list, as it were. So texts that they're not quite canon, but they're pretty good. And so the Shepherd of Hamas and Barnabas often appears in those categories. But as you saw, the Shepherd of Hamas and the Epistle of Barnabas both appear in some canon lists, which I think is absolutely fascinating. And particularly in the case of uh, uh, the Epistle of Barnabas, I really like the Epistle of Barnabas. I think it's a great book. You can also see to some extent why the Shepherd of Hamas doesn't get included. When you look at its content, uh, 
which I suppose you could say the same about Revelation. It's quite out there. Um, it's not basic. You know, when I say basic, it, it requires a bit more uh, explaining, let's say. Uh, for those of you that read it, you'll know what I mean. Whereas, you know, you take the, the Pauline letters, they're all quite basic, right? They, they answer a question, they provide a theological point of view. Same with the Gospels. Revelation is the exclusion to this. And you often find that a lot of the argumentation over canon does center around Revelation because it is so bonkers. So that, that, they're two of the reasons anyway, dating and authorship, and then also slightly in the case of Hamas, more content as well as being too ethereal. Rex Profanus, thank you for your super chat. Where do you think this act of dismissal or ignoring of your point of view come from in academia? Where do most of their preconceived notions come from? So I think it comes from a couple of places. Look, obviously there is the, the um, in some places, the conservative Christian narrative. And you'd be surprised how much that's still dominant, particularly in the case of the UK. Um, most scholars in the UK are Anglicans. They are practicing, often uh, clergy people. And so that, that comes with its own preconceived notions and biases. In the case of the secular world, and um, they're ignoring, I think part of it is that it's so deeply embedded, and I can't get that across to you enough, it's so deeply embedded in our community um, that these are just the given facts. And so to even say they're not, is, is almost like poking the beast straight away, even before you propose a counterpoint of view. Um, if you start suggesting that the, the, the Gospels are all second century, it, it runs against every teaching and thought that 99% of my colleagues have ever considered. And that's always hard to break down our preconceptions and what we've been taught. I, I've talked about the example before on the podcast where when I was first told the seven letters of Ignatius were spurious, I was, I had a visceral reaction. I thought, how can you say that? How can scholarship be so wrong? How can all these people be so wrong? It's not possible. And then looking at the facts, I was convinced almost immediately. And so um, I think that uh, the other problem to this, though, the other part of the problem here is that the counter positions that we're articulating as a fringe have also not been around that long. Or it's not been popularized for that long. Um, and so with time, these things will will slowly make make headway, I think. And so part of it is also the newness. And uh, as, as I begin to publish a bit more and Marcus publishes and Matthias Klinghart published on it and Jason Badoon, as we mentioned, um, Martin and Sally will become more to the forefront. I mean, you know, Adolf von Harnack wrote extensively on Marcion back in back in the, the last century, uh, last century. And yet no one remembers it. Everyone knows Adolf von Harnack. Oh, yeah, great German scholar. Absolute legend. Everyone loves him. But very few people want to sit down and read him and remember some of the things. They're interested in the things they, they want to keep remembering, right? It's a selective amnesia going on. The same is true of Curaton uh, and the Ignatian letters. People forget him because he doesn't suit their narrative. So it's not their fault. It's partly what they've been taught. It's partly the newness of our position. Um, and I think that as we begin to have conversations, and I think that is also often the case, is that um, often I find the most effective method of discussing this stuff is one-to-one. -one. Yes, I can write articles and books and give presentations like this, but it's only when you sit down with someone that you can have that 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 human interaction with them and that constant back and forth that the debate can really take flow. And so as those as more of those happen, I'm sure that this will make headway, or at least I hope so. And again, if I'm wrong, then people will be able to show it. And that's fine too. I don't mind being wrong. That's absolutely fine. It means we both learnt the answer together. Let's do that again next time. But we'll, we'll make headway. We'll get there. Well, thanks for joining me once again, Jack. Thank you. It's been a real pleasure. And I thank everybody for uh, their super chat today. Oh, there is one more super chat that just came in, so we'll just take this one and then head off. Renzo Rodriguez, thank you for your super chat. Do you think Jesus was a human being? Yes. See you next time. <laughs> no, I mean, look, um, if the question is, do you think was Jesus real? Um I, I, you know, I, I think absolutely. Um, I, I, I see the mythicist position, right? I really do. But I also think that to some extent, it's quite an easy position to hold. Um, what I mean by that is that not that it's true, but that it's often it's far easier to criticise than it is to posit a positive. 
And so when people want to talk about people that lived 2000 years ago and say, well, look, you've got no evidence for their existence apart from these couple of texts. And I say, well, yeah, but hold on a minute. I mean, what do you want him to have left? You know, the, the, the works of Shakespeare, a full transcription of, of, of Homer's Iliad signed when dated with his with his name on top. You know, you have to expect the level of evidence for that sort of figure to meet uh, to meet a, a different level of criteria than you would for someone like Julius Caesar. Right. Because he crossed the Rubicon and invaded Rome. There's quite a big difference there in what we can expect from the two. Also, in the case of Jesus, um, I actually uh, I think very strongly that one of the reasons the early church fathers are so cautious in their descriptions of him is because they don't yet have the gospel material. So the only thing they say for certain about Jesus, and I would say this uh, from an academic point of view, as a Christian, I think differently, but from a purely historical point of view, the only thing I can say about Jesus was that he was crucified and a man was crucified and his name was Jesus. That's what I can say for certain. I could probably posit a little bit further that it was under Pontius Pilate, but the the, the the early church fathers, like Ignatius, one Clement, etc., they're so careful not to go on and on, on about Jesus' life or give a list of sayings or give his genealogy or his birth narrative or all his resurrection narrative. The only thing they're willing to explicitly posit again and again is that Jesus was crucified. And I think they knew that was the case. And they don't claim to know anything else. So, yes, Renzo, Jesus was a human being. He was not um, an angel or a, or a floating blob or a, a thought process of someone else's imagination. He was, like you and me, a bloke. I hope that was comprehensive enough. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks again, Jack. And I, once again, I thank everybody for your super chats. And I'll see everybody next time. Thank you. Hello, viewers. Thanks for watching this video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron. And or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during a live stream. Thank you.